I'm very happy that you joined us in our Empowering Voices series. So the first question will be um, starting from something that we say in Italy really often that I thought could be really interesting to analyze. We say that memory is a collective mechanism. So meaning that things get to be remembered if we all collectively make an effort to remember them. So my question will be, what do you think is the role of the community? So of, for example, the San Francisco community or all the communities involved with the HIV AIDS conversation um, now that in this specific time, time period, so in, in 2021? Well, you know, I think that uh, regarding the community and how community comes together, I think the community in many ways for the AIDS crisis, especially out of San Francisco, but, but also nationally, uh, rests at the core of the response. Um, you know, I can't help but go back uh, 35, 40 years uh, when the first cases were being discovered in San Francisco and across the country. And uh, to, rem to remember the the sheer sense of, 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 of helplessness uh, within the community. Um, and for a period of time, uh, there was such helplessness and fear and concern, there wasn't great response. But then I think that is what is indicative of the AIDS response is the community rose up. Uh, the community rose up against stigma and prejudice and discrimination and lack of response uh, uh, to get their, their own arms around what was going on. And in San Francisco specifically, uh, there were in the first uh, five years, there were nearly 50 nonprofits that were created to meet those unmet needs. Uh, the St. Francis Prayer speaks to that, uh, you know, um, and so they, the nonprofits rose up and were created by individuals trying to help their neighbors, uh, help each other um, in the fight, in the, in, the, in the face of such incredible uh, stigma and discrimination. We had a government that chose not to respond. That, that today is known as the San Francisco model of response, which is used around the world now by uh, NGOs. Uh, the best solutions to an issue or a problem within a community come from the community. Uh, the community needs to create its own solutions. Otherwise, they are solutions that are uh, pushed upon them and will not usually sustain themselves. So I can remember marching uh, in San Francisco on Memorial Day marches with candles uh, down Market Street. Um, uh, to remember those lost uh, on Memorial Day, which was also when we would remember Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone that were lost. When you look at the two iconic memorials of which uh, I am honored and privileged to, to lead as the chief executive officer, uh, there's the National AIDS Memorial, uh, which was, <clears throat> excuse me, um, created 30 years ago this month, September. Um, in the darkest days of the epidemic after nearly 15,000 San Franciscans had already been lost. And it was clear that there needed to be an outlet where community could gather, when people could come together and to share their pain and their grief, but also to come together to magnify a sense of hope for the future and that we could get through this <clears throat> together. Uh, two years ago, the National AIDS Memorial was honored to also uh, become the steward of the AIDS Memorial Quilt, which was also created by community. Uh, the AIDS Memorial Quilt uh, started um, by Cleve Jones um, during one of those Memorial Day marches in the early the day, first year or so of the, uh, of the loss that was beginning to happen with regards to AIDS. And he was at the, at the federal building in the Civic Center of San Francisco, and he had people writing on small pieces of card names of people that they had, lo that they had lost over the last numbers of months to this mystery disease. And they put them on the side of the federal building to tell the government, you need to do something. And when he stepped back, he looked at it and he said, this is a quilt. And that's how the quilt was born. So both of these projects were created by the community and the loving hands of the community, whether that's the loving hands that helped to plant lavender within the memorial or the loving hands of family or loved ones that sewed together uh, quilt panels in memory, because that's how we remember that's how we honor the lives. A memorial is about so much more than just the engraved names. It is about the stories of those lives. And with the AIDS crisis, much like other uh, major uh, crises that have had significant loss, <clears throat> where there's a societal thread to it, uh, we must tell the full story, the honest story of stigma, discrimination, and bigotry, and the, and the ills that that has and the harm on society. So at the core of the AIDS crisis is community, rising up, taking action, caring for each other, and <clears throat> being an example to future generations. 
I think that you definitely created an example that we are honored to follow also in the next years. Um, not also, not only because of the necessity that requires remembering. So I think they're remembering the lives of uh, so many people that um, maybe that um, could also be, this is a fundamental step that needs to be addressed. And the community, as you said, needs to sometimes help themselves and otherwise resources, as um, you yourself said, will be pushed onto the community, will not be chosen by the community. And I, it really resonates um, with, also, with all the conversation that we had until now. Also, um, in the past interviews, we talked about the um, availability of resources. So how important it is to have available resources for a community and uh, to get in touch with the people that could provide them. So it, whether that be psychological help or um, solidarity acceptance by family members or friends or also medical medical resources. So um, I was really curious also reading on the National Memorial website of how the presence of the memorial um, interacted with the city. So if the... Um, if you ever felt a shift in people's perception of um, the a around and of the HIV conversation, um, more like um, year after year of the memorial being there. Well, you're you're, you're right that uh, 30 years ago, when the memorial was created, um, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco is the crown jewel of the park system. Uh, of the last 20 years, 15 of those years, it's been ranked uh, one of the top two parks in America, and so for the city to give 10 acres of that Crown Jewel Park uh, to a yet to be formed organization 30 years ago, I think spoke to the impact uh, upon the citizens and city of San Francisco. Because keep in mind today, it's the National AIDS Memorial. 30 years ago, it was the AIDS Memorial Grove. It was a grassroots project of bringing people together. As I say, uh, the healing was happening on either side of the shovel as people were digging and planting and doing things in that nature. Um, because I think nature also uh, by its, by just by it being a natural foundational root of, of where we come from and that we are na nature beings uh, is, is a place where healing can take place. We entered into a relationship with the city where we never wanted the, the space to be on any sort of budget, uh, budget chopping block. So we entered into a relationship with the city where we pay the city back for all the gardeners and wages and benefits, as well as we've invested well over five and a half million dollars in the design and creation. And we've gifted all of this back to the citizens of San Francisco and the nation. So I think it's an example of a public-private partnership, which, which can be used and is used uh, around the country as what, it, what happens when uh, passionate citizens come together and work with city government and work with, with public government uh, to bring about positive ends. You know, I think we've seen in the last uh, 18, 20 months of COVID, uh, the need for communities to come together and to galvanize. Unfortunately, in, in America, I don't believe we've, we've, we've learned our lessons uh, because we have uh, become uh, fragmented and split. But you can see many examples of individuals that are taking action and helping and doing what needs to happen. So, you know, I think that the, the, the key is that that San Francisco in the early days of the epidemic, it was predominantly being impacted by and affected by uh, upon HIV. HIV was impacting gay men, but also it was affecting sex workers, IV drug users. All of those can be looked at as being other. And otherism is one of the greatest ills of our society. If we look upon each other as other, if I look at you as other, then I can more easily devalue your life and your needs. If I look at you as an equal, then you would need to have equal rights to what I want or equal access to what I need and, and to sustain myself. And I think that that is also at the, the, the root of what, of what goes on. You know, I'm blessed every year to bring young people to the memorial uh, for, for uh, college spring breaks and to walk with them and to teach them and to inform and educate them. And it is about otherism. Um, and again, otherism played out in COVID where it was, uh, it was their disease. They sent it to us. It was not, and, it, and it's a disease. It is, not, it is not a lifestyle, it is not a geographical, it is a disease, it is a pandemic. So I think it's important that, uh, I think it speaks to what was going on in San Francisco, uh, that, the, the, that the city leaders stood, stood up and uh, took action to provide a space of healing. You're absolutely right. And 
as you said, um, if if I were to think also about the other people, other people necessities, I would definitely have to revalue mine and also revalue what I think it's um, necessary for um, for life. So to have um, a quality of life, which is um, not to forget one of the most important thing in in our in our time period, especially after the pandemic, and the capacity of people, like the ability of people to overlook somebody else's problem, saying that they are other, they're different from what their community or what they supposedly look like. It's really a problem that has been affecting not also us, but also marginalized groups. So I think well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the LGBTQ plus community or um, communities that really made an effort not to be forgotten uh, in the HIV uh, AIDS conversation. And about this, I really want like a question that I really care about is uh, the history related to the HIV AIDS epidemic has, has affected transversely many communities. So as I said, from the LGBTQ plus to the um, people of color community or the com mar also marginalized communities, many had to fight together against the stigma. What aspect could be the most important to dismantle when speaking about the HIV-related stigma and marginalized communities? You know, you're you're exactly right. You know, the um, the AIDS crisis, uh, the AIDS pandemic, uh, the AIDS social activism. It sat at the nexus, at the intersection of so many different social movements, whether that be LGBTQ uh, or at the time gay rights, uh, whether it be um, access to healthcare. Uh, communities of color, poverty, homelessness, women's, trans. The, the AIDS crisis had the intersectionality of all of those movements coming together in one place, which is a, an incredibly powerful thing. And I believe it, in many ways it, 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 it helped to bring about and galvanize um, um, a response uh, in, that, was, that was broad in its approach. Um, as, as you perhaps have seen, um, on our uh, one of our programs is the Surviving Voices um, Oral History Project, which is connecting to different communities, whether it be the AAPI, whether it be the Native community, uh, women, trans, and the like, all the way through, because each of these different communities needed to provide uh, different solutions, different culturally competent answers to this dilemma. But then when they came together, it was very, very powerful uh, relative to how they could learn from each other. I think one of the most powerful things and one of the things that we sit strongly at the National AIDS Memorial as a commitment to is to make sure that all of those lessons of those different movements that came together uh, to bring about response and action um, are used as touch points, as used as solutions so that other movements in the future, whether it be immigrants' rights, uh, whether it be um, environmental justice, because they're all justice-based. That's the key, they're all justice-based. And so if we, as the National AIDS Memorial, hold our responsibility to tell the story of the epidemic and tell the story of the crisis, not just the names lost, because I believe the most impactful way we can remember those that were lost is to ensure that the story of the, of the tragedy that they went through, uh, the stigma, the otherism, the discrimination, but also the powerful response of love and compassion and social activism will forever be used as a way to continue to improve our society. So I think that that's really the key and the obligation that we have, myself as, a, as an elder, passing down to you as the next generation to ensure that we will forever um, remember those lost and that we'll never forget how we got here. Um, again, as I said, unfortunately, we're repeating some of the same mistakes uh, through COVID that we did with the AIDS crisis. Uh, we're committed to ensuring that we establish and set up a, a process, a, a conduit, an information base, an institute that will teach forever these lessons to future generations so that social movements can go to, from point A to point B as rapidly as possible and bring about the impact by learning from those who went before them. It's so nice to hear um these words of encouragement, not only from a previous generation, but also from someone that has witnessed the community response to the HIV crisis. Because um, I was, of course, I was too young, but um, not too young to see the response of marginalized community to the COVID crisis. And as you said, we made the same, some of the same mistakes, which for example is um, one could be leaving behind 
those who, who are in need or the homelessness crisis, which I believe in California is now stronger than ever. Um, of course, I'm not there, but uh, from the news that I can that I have access to, as um, this is one of the most uh, controversial problem now in in California, and of course, with um, gen speaking about generations, so from the older generation to the to the newer generations, um, and a question that really, um, I think it's important to ask now is what what aspect of the HIV AIDS awareness dialogue or awareness conversation do you think it's important to underline when uh, talking about intergenerational conversation or intergenerational um, passing of, of knowledge? Well, as I, as I said, uh, you know, we were, um, we were blessed a couple of years ago uh, to be trans, have transferred to us for stewardship and for uh, the, the, in perpetuity, the AIDS Memorial Quilt. The Ace Memorial Quilt uh, is the largest uh, community arts project ever created on earth. It was no nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and it is now in a place where we will be taking the quilt out back across America, uh, as well as around the world in the coming years, starting next year in 2022, when hopefully we're on the other side of COVID. Because the quilt by itself, and for, uh, for America specifically, quilting in this country is quintessentially Americana. Uh, and it is, it is also quintessentially uh, found in red districts and states, uh, conservative, where there's issues regarding access to health care, where they're starving the beast relative to support the community where poverty and discrimination and communities of color are at risk continue. Uh, we see that by bringing the quilt into these communities, we can draw out the community. We can start some dialogue. Uh, with the community, uh, because the quilt is sort of a disarming process, and it is so powerful and it touches so many, uh, that we can have those conversations that connect one generation to another. And in so doing, the capability uh, to bring about um, and to dispel stigma, you know, one relationship at a time, you know, as I've learned over my years, the way that I open hearts and minds is just is by one relationship at a time. If they make it real, if it's real with another human being, whether it be, you know, the fact that I'm a gay man or the fact that I've been living with, with the, the virus in my body for well over two, de two decades, almost a quarter century, um, it, it, it makes it much less likely somebody can other me because they know me. And so when they know you, it's different. So I think that that is really the key um, because I think it's important that, you know, uh, future generations, and uh, especially within the LGBTQ plus community, that they realize their history. What is the history? You know, how, how did social activism and the response to HIV and AIDS bring about profound changes in our society, whether it be medical research? You know, here, here's the deal. The shot that I got in my arm and I got the booster a week ago, the shot that I got in my arm, uh, the mRNA uh, Pfizer vaccine, uh, was as a result of the research over the last 40 years trying to find a vaccine for AIDS. That would not have happened so quickly and so responsibly. Now, the hope is that this is now going to go and have a, have a feedback loop back, and there is hope that there will be a vaccine for HIV and AIDS. So I think it's, it's, it's really looking at what is the history. The fact that, 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 that activists chained themselves uh, in this country um, you know, to to the Food and Drug Administration to get get uh, drugs to be to be uh, put out. The fact that the hemophilia community, which is which, which lost over half of their mem the, their community in a short ten year period to to a tainted blood supply, which was a travesty in our nation. So I think that the key is is to keep dialogue conversation. Um, you know, I, I know that the 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 young people today, everything everything basically lives here. Yeah. Uh, which is great, but it, but nothing, and that's where I, I commend uh, until there's a cure for doing this series is nothing can um, replace this, the dialogue of one human being to another, uh, the dialogue of sharing one story with another, and that's the other blessing that I have. I am so blessed to have the opportunity not only to conduct memorial services for families that have lost, but to spend times with individuals that have gone through the crisis, um, and to see. Uh, intergenerational, I, you know, it, we're at a place where grandparents uh, have had the ability with their kids and their grandchildren to spend time in a space and talk about what the crisis is and what it was and what it means to today. And so it's a, it's a matter of conversation. It's a matter of taking the responsibility of storytelling and passing it one generation to another.
it it definitely can um this dialogue cannot be replaced by um by anything else actually was uh, as someone who has um who has been experiencing uh, the storytelling from one generation to the other from one person to the next it's definitely something that cannot be um that cannot be replaced and i totally agree when you say that if you get to know me so for example if you get to know sharon or maybe maybe it could be another intern or um, someone else um the more you get to know somebody the less uh, the less probability of other othering him or her or othering them there can be because people get uh, people understand what they get in touch with and maybe they don't understand it at the first shot maybe they need more time and by needing more time I, there also could be needing more conversations and and open dialogues i think that um i was talking with cody last uh, i think last month and he said you know, it's such a shame that your generation as it kind of feels a little bit distant on the HIV conversation. And I, I, I agree because I, I was like, yeah, it's, you're right. We are distant. It's, it's not something that we experience every day. Uh, it's not a dialogue and not a conversation that we are having every day. But I think we really should with our parents, with our um, grandparents and with our friends. Because um, I really feel there are so many factors that are impacting my generation. Of course, there is the, for example, I also uh, saw this on the National AIDS Memorial website, uh, the Black Lives Matter um, protest and how the black community and how the people of color community was impacted previously by the HIV AIDS uh, crisis and now by the COVID crisis. So all of these intersections, so all of these aspects of the conversation, whether that be um, the LGBT plus community, whether that also other other communities are impacted by that. Uh, w as somebody, as, as a Gen Z, I really feel the struggle of climate justice and social justice. So those are really aspects that are coming up in this, this year, 2021. Uh, we have to keep all these aspects together. And we do this by having this conversation, by having these dialogues, by talking to another. And not leaving, um, not getting, uh, not letting, letting ourselves being stopped by the stigma. Because I really feel like there is, uh, there is the um, the need, and also the, there is the effort to overcome the stigma, especially in young people, and and to and let ourselves also ask questions. How important right. it is for young people to ask you, for example, like to ask, <laughs> to ask all the um, older generations, but also to ask. Um, people that have that have been in this conversation for more than 30 years the important and fundamental questions well you're exactly right because I, I think it's also all of our duty to take action and not to not to ever assume and think that our neighbor is going to take care of this issue no it's our responsibility as citizens to each other and to continue to create a better society that when we see um injustice that we take a step when we see our neighbor in some way being being discriminated against or somebody on a subway train uh, being harassed, um, that that we do something, we take action, we don't stand silent, we rise up uh, because that is the legacy of the AIDS crisis. You know, as, as our mission statement says, you know, by sharing the story of the struggle against HIV and AIDS, we remember in perpetuity the lives lost, we offer healing and hope to survivors, and we inspire new generations of activists in the fight against stigma, denial, hate uh, for a just future. You know, some may say, well, what does that have to do with AIDS? You know, AIDS isn't even, you know, isn't, it, isn't a prominent part of that. It, it's in there. But, but, but the AIDS crisis is a story of, of, of seeking justice in the face of incredible injustice. And that is what the legacy is, that otherwise we just look at it as an insular, uh, singular, singular uh, point in history, but it really is a touchstone to inform future generations about what, what the crisis was and what needs to happen today. Yes, um, totally. We also, re we really need to reflect of what is needed now, whether that be from the community point of view from the generational point of view, and also from the um, survivors, they want to share their stories. So um, um, 
on this note, in your opinion, what could be done in the future to improve the mechanism of shared storytelling? So as you said, um, the National AIDS Memorial hosts the stories of so many people and, and provides the storytelling and also the, the space to, to heal and to remember and the hope that in the future this crisis will be handled better and there will be more and more and more resources as you mentioned the vaccine i really hope that in that i will see maybe when i i'll be a little bit older uh, i i hope as soon as as soon as possible i really hope to see the vaccine in the future and since also the um, covid vaccine was started like we we actually got the possibility of vaccinating us against covid because of the, the reward, yeah because there was um the resource there was there were the resources available from the research on the HIV AIDS uh, conversation. So what could be done in the future to actually um, improve and enhance the shared storytelling mechanism so we can all remember collectively? Well, you know, I think that this is where leveraging, leveraging technology and leveraging the internet uh, can be very, very helpful. Uh, there is a very powerful, um, Instagram site, AIDS Memorial on Instagram, uh, which was created by a, a young man um, in, uh, in Scotland. And it's really, really powerful. Um, you know, we continue to endeavor to, to share the stories uh, across uh, multiple platforms. Uh, you know, we also endeavor in the future as we look to the future to create a space where stories can continue to be, to be brought in and shared. So we're finding it, with the quilt as an example, where the nieces and nephews of, a, of an uncle that was lost decades ago that they may never have known, but he died from cancer because the family couldn't admit what was true and the, the, and the truth uh, of the matter. Uh, and to tell a true story that he died of AIDS because he was a gay man. Uh, when the parents or grandparents have gone on uh, and passed away, Oftentimes now they're coming forth with stories and or creating panels for their lost uh, and potentially unknown uncle um, or family member. So I think it's a matter of, of trying to, uh, to connect to communities in the same platform and same way that they are used to communicating, socially uh, competent uh, ways of engaging, but I think leveraging it and just creating forums such as this, but creating forums where stories can be told you know, we made the decision just a couple of weeks ago that we will again not be doing the National Observance for World AIDS Day in person, uh, but we will be doing a an opportunity for multiple stories. Uh, we're going to be focusing on um, communities of color and their access to healthcare, um, as well as other other powerful stories that will give the the global community the opportunity to come in at their leisure on World AIDS Day or after and to hear stories, to listen to stories and to be a part of what, what's going on. So it's just a matter of continuing to, to push it out and to share the stories. Yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> and it's also great that now uh, the truth, as you said, of the, the true story of so many people that weren't able to share who they really were is coming out. So that more and more, um, we get to see the true essence, like the true realities uh, of people that were not able to say, oh, for example, uh, uh, your uncle died um, because of this, uh, because of these reasons. And, you know, he was a part uh, of, for example, as you mentioned, like he was a gay man or he was part of the LGBT plus community. And I think how important and how affecting that could have been for someone my age, I'm 22, to have someone in their family that they could have looked up um, and for example, to have someone who looks like you. So right. someone, if, if you're part of the LGBT, to have someone who is also part of the LGBT plus community, who can, you can share your, um, your hope for the future. You can share your ambitions and also your fear. Uh, some, something that really works against fear is sharing what, what you feel. And I'm really glad that more that there is more and more acceptance in this conversation, and not only among um, not only among us and the people who work and care uh, in this in this field, but also with other people outside. That we're not uh, we're not closing our doors; we're opening them, so our truth and our, our stories can get really um, to more and more people every day. Um, 
I always ask these questions because I really like to end the interview on, on this note is uh, what is a quote or a saying that you live by? Well, for me, and I was thinking about this yesterday, um, the day after I learned of my HIV status, uh, nearly a quarter century ago, I got two Chinese symbols tattooed on my left shoulder. And the Chinese symbols, the two of them are perseverance and longevity. And I believe that life, uh, life's events come at us uh, I, as, as a human being that's trying to, or as a spiritual being having a human experience. Um, I am not in a place where I should judge life's events. Life's events are as they are. Uh, they're not good or bad or black or white or positive or negative. They are as they are. It's my obligation to take those life's events because they give us energy. Everything that happens in the universe gives us energy. It gives us energy to convert that into something positive for myself and for those around me. And so I would like to say that right after that, I was able to follow that and to convert that into positive energy. But the truth of my story is not. I became addicted to drugs for a number of years and I spiraled down, but I have always had hope. Um, I was blessed to have had a full life before. Um, I also had a family that supported me. Uh, I eventually came to the place where my HIV status, as well as my addic addiction that I have now been clean and sober for nearly, uh, nearly 20 years, um, has served me uh, to be able to serve others. Because at the end of the day, um, as I say to young people when they come to the memorial and they're college students, and like I say, you know, I hope you study something that's very interesting and that you leave, and you get a great job and that you make a lot of money. But at the end of the day, the money is not going to make you happy. It's how you engage with human to human and how you bring about an improvement in the community and the society that you live in. As a friend of mine says, when, when we're up in our head and we're struggling, breathe in, breathe out, and help another human being. And that's the legacy of the AIDS crisis. It's one person helping another. It's everybody doing it in their own way. Not everybody was marching in the streets. Some were just cooking meals. Uh, some were, were helping individuals uh, get to doctor's appointment. Everybody had their own role. And I also feel that it's important for me to acknowledge that the lesbian community showed up in a powerful way for gay men when they couldn't show up for themselves. We were losing so many people on a daily basis that uh, we were unable to barely show up for ourselves, but it was women and it was the lesbian community that helped to show up and have the courage to help us move forward. So, you know, I, I think that the, the key here is, it is in the hands of future generations to pick up the baton and move forward. One of our other programs we have is the Pedro Zamora Young Leader Scholarship Program. Pedro Zamora was a young 20 something Latin, uh, HIV positive gay man, boy from South Florida who had been doing HIV and AIDS work in the Latinx community in South Florida when MTV approached him to go on the real world season two in San Francisco. The nation got to see this young man go through a process of going through the virus and he died two days after the airing of the last episode. It is that legacy of his selflessness. He didn't go on MTV because he wanted to be a TV star. He went on MTV because he wanted a bigger platform. He wanted a bigger microphone to shout from the top and tell people that they needed to take action and do something. I think that's the, what we all need to do is to pick up that baton, that microphone, that megaphone and take action to improve the community we live in. Thank you. There, there is not much that I can say um, uh, unless I will start crying. So I really feel like <laughs> I will just stop here and say thank you. <laughs> yes. it's, so, it's, it's so moving to get in touch with, so, with the stories of people from all over the world. And when you're trying to make a change to see other people who have been doing this for the past 30 years and more, yeah, it, it's really, um, it, 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 it's impacting, but it, it's so great. Um, I'm so glad uh, that we, can, we had the opportunity to have this conversation and that our lives have crossed, even though we are on the literal opposite side of the world. <laughs> so right. it's, so, it's so nice. Well, I, hope you'll, I hope you'll be able to come here at some point. I'll, I'll, I'll tell Nora that she needs to bring you over. 
I really want to see uh, the the memorial site. <laughs> like yeah. once it, it it will be so great. I've never been to San Francisco and I never been to the Golden Gate Park where I've seen so many pictures and I think it will be such a spiritual and and strong experience that that we we should all have one day <laughs> or another because it it I think it will be really intense but it will be really great. Where, um, where are you in where are you in Italy? Um, I'm in Rome right now. I'm in Bari, in my hometown. Um, okay. I uh, normally I, I live in Rome. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> Great. Right. We were my husband and I were there a couple of years ago. We were in 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 Rome and in Florence, and then spent two weeks in uh, in uh, Positano. Oh, you liked it? I did. I did. I did. It was absolutely amazing. It was beautiful. Um, we went to, and then we also were in Sweden. My niece uh, uh, lives in Sweden and works in Sweden. Uh, so we went and visited there as well. So yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I really wish I can come to the, like, I, I think I will, but it will be so great uh, after the pandemic is over. <laughs> so. Right, so you can actually, actually enjoy it. Well, thank you for your work. Thank you for all you're doing. And if there's ever anything that you need from me, uh, questions or otherwise, whether it's be part of Until There's a Cure or yourself personally, please feel free. You've got my email. You know where to find me. Thank you. Um, thank you for everything. Um, really, it was a really nice conversation. And thank you for taking part in, the, in our Empowering Voices series. Um, I can't wait for this episode to be, uh, to be edited and then posted. So I will send everything to you as soon as, soon as Melissa and, and Nora get to see this and everyone works on it. And then I can definitely share all the material great. with you. But great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great, have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.